much about the, the historical aspect of, of, of the material, but just, uh, just uh, noting that, uh, that Mark 1 and verse 1 uh, opens with the beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel. And Mark begins his beginning of the gospel with the work of John. And so, uh, and, and, and John's baptism, uh, which is said to be uh, unto repentance for the remission of sins. And uh, the word uh, repent is the key word. As we think about uh, his ministry at the bottom of page one, uh, John's message was a message of change. Uh, in Matthew 3 and verse 8, uh, the Pharisees came to, Jesus, uh, came to John in view of his preaching. And, uh, and, uh, and John, uh, obviously John knew more than we know because he was there. Um, and so, for example, in Matthew 3, you know, in Matthew 3 and verse 8, he saw, he saw the Pharisees coming, it says, coming to his, uh, coming to his baptism, the Pharisees and Sadducees. But it says, when they came, he warned them. He warned them, saying, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring fruits worthy of of repentance and he goes on with four more verses of, of pretty extreme language and when I mean extreme I mean harsh language for the Pharisees and the Sadducees but uh, but it's one of those things that uh, you know John was there and he knew what the situation was because it seems it seems odd for example it seems odd that uh, that if I were go, let's just say I'm in the middle of that, that the tent meeting. I'm in the middle of the tent meeting somewhere, and and it's filled with people. And at the invitation, some people come and they request to be baptized. All right. Now, if I was there, I wouldn't really ask a whole lot of questions, would I? Because I don't know those people. But John knew who he was dealing with, and so because John knew who he was dealing with, in other words. You know, if somebody was coming forward in one of our assemblies or in a gospel meeting to be baptized, I wouldn't respond by saying, you brood of vipers. You know, that's not probably the first word that's going to come out of my mouth. But, but John, knowing the people and the situation, uh, knew that there was something that was not sincere about their, uh, about their response. Or there was some... Um, there was some something that was lacking in their understanding. Um, it's almost like the Pharisees were in some way persuaded by John's preaching and the, and the persuasive nature of his preaching, but they were not necessarily convinced that John's message was from God, but maybe they want to make sure they got all their bases covered. Or maybe, maybe they did it to gain favor with the people. You know, you know later on we know in Matthew 21 that, uh, that the Pharisees, and by the way, when you talk about the Pharisees, it's not like that there was 15 of these guys and you're talking about the same 15 people all the time. I mean, there were, there were a number of Pharisees and they would have been scattered throughout you know, the, the area uh, of, uh, of Judea. Uh, but uh, you, know, you, have, you have these Pharisees and um, uh, again, it, the the mind the mindset of the Pharisees in Matthew twenty one was we are we're afraid not to say that John's baptism was from men, or we're afraid to say that John's baptism is from men, and we sure don't want to say it's from heaven because then he's going to ask us why we didn't obey it. And so there are, there are a lot of things that come into play with John's response to the Pharisees. Uh, I cannot help but think about Acts seven. Stephen's preaching. He's preaching to these Jews. He runs through a, a history of, of, the, of, the, of the Jewish people or, or of the Israelite people. And then just all of a sudden, he's just, he just starts railing on them in verse 53. You uncircumcised and hardened ears. You, know, you always resist the Holy Spirit, even as your fathers did. It's like here he is preaching, and all of a sudden, he just goes into this rant, so to speak. Again, we weren't there. But Stephen was there. And so Stephen, you know, Stephen had insight as to what was going on in that, in that setting 
uh, that we do not have. We just have to understand that whatever Stephen said was the right thing to say, just like we understand that whatever John said... Right, yeah. And it, it's either and it, shock him, it's either shock him or rebuke him. Right, yeah, in either case, with John or Stephen. Of course, Stephen right. was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6. And so, and so uh, but the message, of, the message of, of, uh, of John is a message of, of repentance. That's the bottom of the page. It says, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. And... Uh, uh, it goes on to make the note that repentance is not just being sorry. It means to change the way you think about a thing and then change the way you live. Uh, you, know, you know, any number of people can be sorry without repenting. They, you know, they, for example, they can be sorry they got caught. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says that godly sorrow produces repentance. In other words, sorrow is not repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance, which is not to be regretted, uh, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. Um, and this, is, this can be a difficult task as well. And let me explain. While I was in, when I was in Texas last week, uh, Toby, and, uh, Toby and Bill were there. Well, Toby was there Monday night and Tuesday night, and Aaron Allsbrook was there Monday night and Tuesday night. Of course, both those guys have been to Ghana a number of times, and, and then Bill was there on Tuesday night, and you know, we're all sitting there and we're all, of course, we're reminiscing after services and, and uh, we, were talking about, uh, we were talking about a situation in Ghana uh, wherein uh, there, was a big, there was a big dispute uh, between faithful brethren over the matter of what are, you know, what are the demands of repentance. And uh, the dispute was over. Here comes a man... Uh, here comes a man uh, in response to the preaching of the gospel uh, who says that he wants to obey the gospel and be baptized. And it's known, it's known uh, uh, in the community, in the village, that this man has two or three or four or five wives. And, and so knowing that, the, the, the rub in that case was... Uh, uh, Daniel and some of the old, what we call some of the old heads, said they would not baptize a man simply on his profession of faith and his statement that he intended to correct the situation. In other words, he has to go back and go through all the legal processes or whatever those are to get rid of all those wives, and then he can come and be baptized. Well, Tetchy, you know, one of our close associates there as well, Tetchy says, he says, that's not right. He said, if the, man, if the man says he's going to do right, you, you, know, you, baptize him, you baptize him when he professes faith in Christ, and you baptize him when he says, I know that I'm in the wrong, but I'm going, I'm going to fix it. And the, as we said, the old heads, man, they, they just all but excommunicated Tetchy over that. And, uh, and I think Tetchy's right. I think Tetchy's right. I mean... I mean, just think, you, you may think about, you know, just in, the, look, just in the United States, all right? Just in the United States. Think about, all the, think about all the legalities that would have to be gone through in order to correct a situation like that and how long that would take. Weeks, maybe even months, right? And so, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to hold a man, we're going to hold a man responsible for the legal system taking forever when, he's, when he says he's going to do right. And, of course, what Toby came back with, he says, Look, the man says he's going to do right, and it's on him to do right. It's on him to fix it. Now, if he goes back later on and he doesn't fix it, that's on him. That's you know, that's not on. It's like Toby. That's not on us. It's on him. What are you going to say, Sean? Hold on, I'll get you a minute. Sir. Right. And he was, that change was going on on the inside. But you said, like you said, he's got a long process of doing that. So is he supposed to wait until he dies before he gets it done to be saved? He can't. Right. Well, the only, the only reason that you would withhold baptizing is if they had an uh, improper understanding. Yeah. Right. If that, but the other things is, you know. Right. Bob. 
they took care of it pretty well. If uh, if something happened to him, you know, and that one that refused and baptized, man, I would not. I would not want to be in the shoes of, of, of that of those guys if if that was the case. That's right. They withheld baptism from a man who wanted to be baptized, understood the process, understood what was necessary going forward. Your life could be in such absolute shambles that you got straightened up. Yeah. You... Yeah. And, 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 by the way, and it's not. It's not like. By the way, it's not like people don't have a lot of other issues in their life that have to get straightened out afterward as well, right? I mean, that just happens to be one that we can that we can see. And at the same time, see that there's a ton of legal, you know, there's, there's a ton of legalities and, and things involved uh, in that matter that you would, to me, present a problem to 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 put a you know put a man off. I mean, cause think about it. when we baptize an individual, don't we just take it? Don't we just under, take it as an understanding that they're going to do right? I mean, when a person responds and says, "I believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God, and I want to be baptized for remission of my sins." Don't we just kind of take that as as a as an in, in an understanding that that I'm gonna do you know going forward I'm gonna do everything I can to live for Jesus and we don't know we don't know what all things that that person may have to deal with right? So, and those guys could have been mixing church membership with association with with the baptism and that's not that's not correct. Well, I think they were misusing Matthew three and verse eight. In other words, you got to bring forth the fruit first, and and that's and 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 the situation and the situations are not parallel. John's situation in Matthew three was not the same situation that those guys were facing in uh, in uh, in Ghana, and so uh, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life, and, and and it's not just a one it's not just a one time thing. I mean, we should always be we should always be in the exercise of our mind, looking for ways to be more and more like Jesus, right? And whenever I'm in the process of, of, uh, of uh, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever I find myself lacking in an area or, or completely missing the mark in some area, then that continual mind of repentance says, I'm going to fix this. I wasn't aware of it before, and now I'm aware of it, and I'm going to fix it. And so, uh, you know, there's, I think there's some, there's some things to be learned uh, from John's situation uh, and those that uh, we might face in some cases today. All right, next page. The baptism of John's ministry. The baptism of John's ministry. It says that John became known as the Baptist. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Um, it's, it says that some claim that John's baptism was a Jewish ceremonial washing. But that is not right. Because John's baptism didn't have anything to do with Judaism. Other than, other than to connect Judaism to Christianity. In other words, John was, John was bridging a gap. John was bridging a gap for the Jews to get them to Christ and what, and what the demands of the gospel were going to be. It wasn't just a matter of what his baptism, the fact that he was baptizing, it was also the matter of what he was teaching as a, as a precursor to that baptism and what kind of life would have to be lived after they were baptized. You know, we, we can read this in, in, in Luke's account. You know, the soldiers came to John said, what do we got to do? Well, he said, well, you know, don't extort money from people. Be content with your wages, which seemed to be, uh, which seemed to be something that would have been consistent with the actions of soldiers in that, in that time. All right? Now, when those soldiers came to John and asked him those questions, I think we, it's safe to assume they were also being baptized by John. So then they're asking, now, you know, now that we've been baptized, what, how do we need to live after the fact? And so, and so we, we find this in Luke chapter 3, that the, 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 the ministry of John was to, was to help bridge the gap between Judaism and Christianity for the Jewish, for the Jewish people and, 
for example, also any Jewish uh, Jewish converts. And so, and so, you know, I, I don't think there's any connection whatsoever. I don't think there's any connection whatsoever to uh, John's work and Judaism in the sense that John was borrowing from Judaism because the Bible clearly says John's message was from God, right? In other words, John wasn't borrowing from the law of Moses. John was preaching, you know, John was preaching what God told him to preach and practicing what God told him to practice. And then note in the second paragraph, one reason we know it was not a ceremonial washing because this became his vocation. If many others were doing it, John would have not been given an identifying title. Notice that John, John is not a Baptist, he's the Baptist. The means one, one of a kind. Words, there, weren't a lot of other, there weren't a lot of other people out there doing what John, doing what John uh, was doing. Uh, although some of John's disciples baptized, and we know that Jesus taught baptism, and I want to I get to that here in just, in, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the linguistic considerations are in the third paragraph there under the baptism of his ministry. Uh, the word Baptist is a transliterated Greek word. Uh, adding this ending uh, to baptize is similar to adding uh, like T-O-R, like an actor or a doctor. Uh, Baptist literally means one who baptizes. That's in other words, he's, he's the John who baptizes. It separates him from all the other Johns. You know, there was John the Apostle. You know, John was a common name in the first century, just like Jesus was a common name in the first century. That's why he's called Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and not just, you know, in case just Jesus, he's Jesus of Nazareth, so identifying which Jesus it is uh, uh, or what, uh, who it is under consideration. And so then the fourth paragraph speaks that John's baptism was one of immersion, which it's like, well, duh. But then he goes on in the next paragraph, says, because that's what the word means. The Greek word for baptism means to immerse, to submerge, to overwhelm. Um, this is, by the way, this is a word that was in common usage in the first century. In other words, it's not like it was an invented. It wasn't like it was an invented word that they just came up with to describe what John was doing. The word "baptize" or, or to, to baptize a thing was in common usage during that day and time. For example, in Mark chapter seven, uh, there is the, there is the reference to the washing uh, the washing of, of of pots and pans. Uh, there is also the reference to the to the uh, to many of the Jews. Uh, would uh, bathe, you know, when they came in from the marketplace, when they were in the area where the Gentiles were, uh, that they would they would not eat until they bathed. You know, they would they would take you know take a bath, and so this is a very this was a common word, but it was a common word that got a new uh, nuance to it, for lack of a better term. It still meant the same thing, but the meaning was a, there was a new meaning attached to it. In other words, rather than just the Rather than just the washing off of dirt, now it has the, the spiritual application of the washing of sins, which is why Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure whereunto baptism does now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, not taking a bath to get clean like you would at the end of the day, but rather an appeal to God for a good conscience. And so the spiritual aspect, the spiritual uh, application is given to the word uh, in uh, in the first century. Um, we know that uh, he baptized in the Jordan River. Um, he baptized at Anan, John three twenty three, because there was much water there, much water there. Uh, John and Jesus came up out of the water. Uh, Mark one and verse ten. Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. Um, I, will make a, I will make mention of John 3.23 on this count. Um, there was much water there. All right. Now the same John that wrote that also wrote John 3.3-5 3, 3 when he 
when he uh, recorded the words of Jesus, when he said, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, for over 1,500 years, everybody, everybody understood baptism, or uh, born of water and spirit to be a reference to baptism. From the days of the first century, look, you can read the writings of the, of the Ananiacine fathers, the people that lived between, between the apostles and the year 323, 325. Unanimous. That born of water and spirit is a reference to baptism. Then you can read the writings from the, from the 4th century to the 16th century. And everybody's still in agreement that born of water and spirit is a reference to baptism. That the born of water is not a reference to amniotic fluid. You know, that, that, that terminology... That terminology is way over 1,000, 1,500 years after the first century. In other words, it wasn't, it was never, water was never used in that, in that sense. And so, uh, and so I just make mention of that to show that, that John wrote water and spirit in John 3, 5, and he wrote water in John 3, 23, and he's talking about the same thing. He, you know what he's talking about? Water. H2O. Man has to be born of H2O and spirit in order to see uh, the kingdom of God. And in the last paragraph there is that John's baptism was for uh, the remission of sins. And so uh, I did some reading, and I wish I had time. I, I, matter of fact, I even brought the book that I've uh, uh, been using, studying, actually a study of the word baptism, through the, uh, through, particularly through the New Testament. And uh, by the way, and not one of the writers is a member of the church. Not one. And, uh, and, and they got it right time and time and time and time again. In other words, they were honest with the text. They're, they're, they're scholars. You know, they're, 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 they're biblical scholars. And they, they got it right time and time and time again. You know, that, uh, that uh, baptism is for the remission of sins. Uh, one guy was quoted uh, in, in contradiction and here's what he said about uh, uh, Nicodemus and that baptism there in John 3, 5, or the water and spirit. He says, there's no way Nicodemus would have understood that as baptism. Now, that's not the point. The point is not what did Nicodemus... By the way, that can't even be proven. Because John has already, John has already been full-blown in his ministry for a long time. All right? And so, so Nicodemus is well familiar with the work of John and the baptism of John. But whether or not Nicodemus understood Jesus to be talking about baptism there is not relevant. The question is, was Jesus talking about baptism there? And the answer to that question is yes. You say, well, you know, why would you say that? Well, also in the book of John... You find in chapter uh, 2, when Jesus cleanses the temple, he said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. All right? Did they, did they understand what Jesus said when he said that? No, because the next verse says, after he was risen from the dead, they understood that he was talking about the temple of his body. So it's not, it's not a matter of did Nicodemus understand what Jesus was talking about. The question, what was Jesus talking about regardless of Nicodemus' understanding? Which, by the way, we know he didn't understand because he asked if a man could go back into his mother's womb and be born again. Right? And so, and so and in the same fashion, when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days, even the disciples didn't understand it. Much less the people who didn't believe, but that, but it doesn't mean that wasn't what he was talking about, and so and so that was just to me it just wasn't wasn't a very good wasn't a very good argument. And then I wanted to make mention of this. Look in John chapter look in John chapter three. I want to make mention. I want to talk just for a moment about John's baptism here. We're going to begin in verse. Uh, 22, John 3 and verse 22. 
It says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. It says, Now John also was baptizing at Anan near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, look at verse, uh, well, let's keep reading verse 25, 26. Then there arose a dispute between some of my, uh, John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Now, I want you to go down to chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 and 2. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Now, when you, when you put these three sections about baptizing together, we learn first and foremost that Jesus himself did not administer baptism. Jesus did not administer baptism. It's spoken of as if he baptized. In other words, it says he remained there and baptized. But then later it says, but he himself did not baptize, but his disciples baptized. And, and I think... Well, the Bible doesn't tell us why, but I think we can figure it out. I mean, we already know that we already know that the Corinthian. I mean, we know now that the Corinthian church was divided over who had baptized them. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. So we know we know that people can get a misunderstanding about who it is that baptizes them. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've met in Walker County who made it a point to tell me that Gus Nichols baptized. As if that's anything. I mean, listen. A hobo can baptize you and it's just as valid as if Gus Nichols did it. I couldn't think of anything. I was going to say bum. I just said hobo. I'm sorry. I don't know. The point is, the point being made is that we could bring somebody off the street in here to baptize them. That's exactly right. We could bring somebody off the street in here to administer baptism, and it would be just as valid as if Gus Nichols did it. All right? But, so we understand, we understand that people can get the wrong idea about who baptized them. Now, can you imagine what kind of problem it would have been if Jesus had personally baptized people? Right? It would be, it'd be a problem. But then we also note in this that uh, it, 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 it's accurate to say that Jesus baptized when he did not physically baptize. All right? And this is a verse that, Lord willing, in a few minutes will, will be introduced in my sermon. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. John 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Question, did Pilate physically take the scourge in his hand and walk out and administer the blows to the back of the Lord Jesus? No. But we all understand what that, we all understand what that means, right? That Pilate authorized it to be done. And so in so authorizing it to be done, it was, a, it was as if he had done it himself. It's just a figure of speech. So when the Bible tells us that Jesus baptized, and then later it says he did not baptize himself personally, but his disciples did. We know that, G, that, that, the, that the apostles baptized under the authority of Jesus, thus it was... It was accurate to say that Jesus himself baptized. Now, one, one more thing I want to make mention of. Some have misunderstood John 4 to teach that Jesus only baptized his disciples. In other words, Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. And, 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 which some people think, well, Jesus must have baptized the twelve. And then he didn't baptize anybody else. But that won't work either. Because... 
in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, when they were looking for a successor to Judas, the statement was made, of all these men who are here with us, from the baptism, who have been with us, from the baptism of John, and also as a witness to the resurrection. So what does that tell us? It tells us that all of the apostles were disciples of John before they ever met Jesus Christ. And so if they were disciples of John, who baptized them? John did. Or one of John's disciples baptized him, you see. And so, so we learn that Jesus himself did not baptize personally his apostles, the twelve baptized in, uh, in his in his name. All right, uh, we're not going to get to the questions, but let's finish the lesson and then start next week with the questions. Um, the preparation of his ministry. John said, He who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. Of course, removing sandals was the work of a servant. And John said, I'm not fit even to, I'm not fit even to take his sandals off. He must increase and I must decrease. By the way, in the text, I had to skip some verses for the sake of time in John chapter 3. You know, John's disciples were concerned that more people were being baptized by Jesus' apostles than were being baptized by John. And that's when John started in with, you know, you know he's the bridegroom. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not the focus. He's the focus. He must increase. I must decrease. You know, over and over again, John is trying, John is trying to get Jesus into in the minds of people, pushing Jesus to the front while he himself stepped back into the shadows. And so, uh, so the, the, the preparatory work of, of John's uh, uh, ministry was to point people to Jesus. And by the way, just as a, just as a, have we had a bell yet? Okay. Just as an aside thought, maybe it was the case that, that John's arrest and execution were a divine means by which God used to get John out of the picture. And it wasn't because John wanted to stay in the forefront. It was because of the propensity of men to keep John in the forefront. And when all those people went out in the desert out in the wilderness to meet John, he was trying to push them back toward Jesus. Right. The whole time. That's right. The whole time he's trying to get people to see Jesus. All right. And then it says, uh, um, he says, I baptize you with water under repentance, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this text to mean that Acts 2 was the fulfillment of both of those, the Holy Spirit and fire. But that's not right. There was no fire in Acts 2, right? There were what? Cloven tongues like as of fire. And so Acts 2 is not the fulfillment of both of those statements. It's the fulfillment of the first one, Baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the fulfillment of the baptism of fire. The baptism of fire comes at judgment. In other words, those that those that are not uh, uh, those that are disobedient uh, to the Lord. And by the way, John's language, John's language there in Matthew three, his winnowing fan is in his hand. In other words. You know, the, 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 the grain would be tossed and whatnot, and then it would be fanned. In other words, to get the wheat separated from the chaff and the dust. And it would be fanned all in one corner and then gathered up. And, you know, what was the, 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 the husks and whatnot were set on fire. And that's what, that's what John, that's the picture that John uses. Jesus is fanning this thing. He's going to find out, he's going to find out where the wheat is, and he's going to separate the chaff from the wheat, and the chaff is going to be burned in, bur burned in the fire. And so the baptism of fire is, is, uh, is eternal punishment for those who are not saved. But the baptism of the Spirit, being baptized of the Holy Spirit, uh, first took place in Acts 2, 
And secondly, it took place in Acts 10 and then never happened again. Never happened again. All right, so uh, um, that takes care of the preparation, the preparation of his ministry. Of course, the application there is, you know, John had a purpose. He understood it and performed it according to God's word. And then how about us? Well, you know, what is, you know, what is my purpose and how am I preparing the way uh, for the, you know, John prepared people for the appearance of the Lord and we need to prepare people for the appearance of the Lord. The second, you know, the Bible says he'll return a second time or he will appear a second time. Hebrews uh, chapter 7, I believe it is. And so, uh, so, you know, we need to prepare people for the appearance of Jesus uh, when he comes back to judge the world. All right, Lord willing, next week we will start the questions and then move into lesson plan 10. So that'll be October 2nd.